these testimonies or these, these sessions, that they, they might open up a whole new way for you to hear and to see and to experience God. So I encourage you, jump in. Also, the youth are having a, uh, um, a car wash coming up and getting ready for making their money for a youth conference that they're going to. So if any of the youth come up to you, don't be surprised. Uh, they might be asking you to buy a ticket for a car wash, okay? So don't be surprised at that. But we just want to support our kids, and whatever we can do to get them just, just pursuing the Lord and just, just coming alongside and saying, yeah, you go, you go. We need to do it, okay? All right. So you got my, my rah-rah cheers. Uh, weren't you just ready to come and to worship the Lord and get our eyes focused on Him? I was. After a rough week in the United States, it was good to come into the presence of the Lord, wasn't it? It's good to do that every day, just to keep coming into His presence and hearing His heart and hearing His voice. And as, as probably most of you had experienced grief and sadness this week, I, I, I too was, was, was struggling, was grieving, was saddened at the events of this week. And, and we're going to do something at the end of the service, kind of an activation and a prayer, and uh, hopefully just a, just a real healing time. I believe it's going to come. Uh, but this week as I was just confronted with all of these things, you know, what, what shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things? Uh, the Lord just began to talk to me about some, some scriptures and things and and, and I, he was just asking me so that we have in a God of peace and that the God of peace will crush Satan. Wait, Jim, that's, that's kind of weird. That's This verse, and I think it was a good activation. We're, we're going to do something different at the end. But this church did this activation, and he said, okay, I want you to take your shoes off. And you don't have to do that in here, but you could if you wanted to. He'd take your shoes off, and I want you to write down, I want you to take a pen or something, and I want you to write down something that the enemy has been lying to you about.
Christ will soon crush Satan. The best thing in the kingdom of God for us to do to, to just strife and pain and hate and all multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I love the kingdom of God. I love the weapons of our warfare. But the weapons of our warfare are not earthly. They're not worldly. They're not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not of this earth. They are of the heavens. So the weapons of our warfare are the characteristics and the the manifestations of who God is, his glory, that that is what we, that that is the ammunition of our warfare, is who God is, by, by what he says, by, by what his character is, we war from that place. So let's go to, to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. We, we learned this, and I, I've learned this throughout my life, just a lot of this. Um, when the enemy comes in at you in a certain way, you have to push back. And in fact, a lot of times you have to push back with the exact to see breakthrough. Otherwise, it just keeps coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. And... I remember uh, Valerie and I, we had a word from the Lord, the next baby will represent a season of joy, and, and we got pregnant, and, and uh, expecting a baby, we were so excited, and we lost that baby, and we were just devastated, so, so difficult, and we were like, Lord, what was, what, what was going on, what, you know, and, and not a lot of answers, but we did have, a, we did have an assurance that God was, God's word was true, and he was true, and he said, just keep believing, keep trusting. And we got pregnant again. And we were just believing and we were so excited and, and, and we lost that second baby. And certainly not lost, certainly with Jesus, you know, thankfully missing, but, but not, not lost. But we didn't have the earthly expression of this wonderful gift of God. So we were devastated. And really was trying to work through these things. And it, it, was, it was a process of working through some things. And we got pregnant again. And that third time we got pregnant, everything within us was saying, just don't say anything to anybody. Don't talk about it. Just, just be quiet and, and, and just keep it to yourself because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. And so Valerie and I started talking about that fear. And we were like, no, that does not come from God. That the enemy wants to steal our joy. He wants to see, steal our celebration. He wants to steal what this wonderful thing is that God has done in our life. And so as soon as we knew we were calling everybody. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, I'm going to call just a couple people in the family and tell them, forget it. It was like, no, I'm telling everybody we are expecting a child. We are so excited for what God has done. And we're going to tell every single person that we know about this good news. And it, it totally broke. It, it broke that fear. It, it broke the pain it, it, it broke just our, our doubt and our unbelief that stepping out in that opposite spirit was the only thing that I think that was going to really break it. And, and that was an example to us. It was, it, was a, it was a faith step for us to take to walk in this place of, of freedom that God really wanted us to walk into. And to experience what he wanted us to experience. And I think there are so many times in the Christian life that we need to recognize the enemy is coming at us one way. We need to go right back into his face. In your face, Satan, is what I say. 
I have a little girl, not so little anymore. She's getting, uh, I want to think she's still little. Um, I still have a 10 year, I have a 10 year old redheaded girl that I, I love dearly. And I couldn't imagine my life without. And we are so thankful for the gift of God and that the joy that came because, because we continue to trust, because God even gave us the strategies. I want you to come against that thing. And that's what he does. So the problem is we have all these things coming against us. It says in, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians. They're going through all kinds of persecution and afflictions. And he sent them a letter, and they, they began to read into his letter some things that weren't there. And so he's trying to correct, correct some of their thinking. And part of their thinking was, oh, my goodness, the day of Jesus has already come, and his, his second coming has already come, and we missed it. And so Paul is like, no, I'm going to try and show you, show you uh, what you really need to look for. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, verse 1, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or, or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Because that's not what I was saying. And if you're receiving that understanding, that's not right. The day of the Lord has not come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So what are the two things that we're looking for? We're looking for the apostasy and the man of lawlessness to be revealed. So the first thing is the apostasy. What does that mean? It means the falling away from the truth. And in fact, the word is not just a falling away, but it's a defection. It's a forsaking the truth. It's, it's, I know the truth, and I'm going the other way. I'm choosing not to, not to embrace truth. I'm choosing to, to cover it over and walk away from it. That that great falling away is going to happen first. Wow. Hmm. I think we've seen uh, a lot of that in our society. We've seen the desire that, 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 even people would, would recognize that people are not truthful and still wanting them to lead them. That is a stepping away from the truth. That is an apostasy. That is a walking away. That is a falling away. So the first thing was, was an apostasy. And I was even thinking, uh, I don't know if you saw this about uh, in, in Iowa, uh, a law had been passed or they're interpreting the law to mean that, that pastors and, and cannot preach on Genesis 1 that describes God as creating man in his image, creating them male and female. Because that is offensive. Because that is unwelcoming. Because that is akin to hate speech. And therefore against the law. And I think, wow, we can't even agree. We can't even agree where we came from. We can't even agree that we have been created by God. We, we don't agree on that. We can't even agree on what is a male and a female. We can't agree on marriage. We can't agree on what is a baby. When is a baby made? We can't agree on all of these basic fundamental things. And it's because, the, because of the apostasy. It's because of the falling away. The second thing is the man of lawlessness will be revealed. And what does that word mean? It just means a man of no law. That that man of lawlessness will, will be revealed. Let's go on. It says, let no one in any way deceive you that unless he comes, then the day of the Lord will not come. And he, in verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. Well, there's a key right there. Daniel talks about this. This is the abomination that causes desolation. This is where, God, where, where the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, comes and he sets himself up as God and says, you must worship me. But as we will see, that's nothing new. 
Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed? So he is being restrained until the time that he is revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. I don't want us to key in on that. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. All kinds of interpretations on that one. Then the law, <laughs> then the law could be the church, could be the Holy Spirit, could be Michael the archangel. I have my personal opinion. Then the, law, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end the appearance of his coming. What was the problem? The problem was the man of lawlessness, about the apostasy and the man of lawlessness. It is no coincidence that truth is being shunned and then the man of lawlessness rises. That's just the, that's the correlation, that if you shun truth, then you will embrace lawlessness. What has happened in our country? We have completely shunned truth. We have shunned what God has said, what God has designed as, as we should be. And if you shun truth, then lawlessness must rise. That is the spirit at work in the earth right now. Is this spirit of lawlessness. We saw it at the beginning of the week. That you can say all kinds of things. You can even lie to the FBI, but that's okay. That's okay. And that the FBI says that's okay. And so when you say that, well, we know the truth, but we're not going to, we're not going to prosecute, we're not going to pursue this because there's just external circumstances that, you know, this is, this is something that's, you know, above everybody else. Then we just, what have we done? We put an end to truth. And that if we have no truth, then lawlessness must rise. So it's, it's not a coincidence, I believe, that the things that we saw in the news all happened this week. So, Jim, what you're saying is the thing with the FBI made, made all of these other shootings happen? I'm saying that spirit is at work in the earth, and he is making these things happen. So what is then the answer? Well, right in Thessalonians, we get the answer. Now, this is an end times understanding, but we see that it's also a now reality, right? It's not just only something that will happen at the, at the day of the Lord, but it is a, a happening right now that, that John says there, there, there will be an antichrist, but there have been already many antichrists. The Antichrist spirit has been operating. And this is what John was saying in just the first century. He was saying there's already been all kinds of Antichrists. So we know that the Antichrist spirit has been working and moving. Well, gosh, Jim, that's really, th that's really exciting and encouraging. But we have the answer, which, I, which, which we'll see here. It says that, so the man of lawlessness, he was already at work, until he is taken out of the way, then verse 8, then, the, then that lawlessness, that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. By his manifestation. The, the word appearance, that, that, that revealing, that is uh, finero, and it's just the display. And Scripture uses this display, this manifestation to talk about the Son of God when he comes in glory. But he also uses it in another way. In, uh, <laughs> and, and I won't turn to it just right now, but in, in, uh, in 1 John 3, it talks about, For this reason the Son of God came, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Right? For this reason, the Son of God was, actually the word was manifest, the same word here. For the same, for the same thing, that this is why Jesus came, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That manifestation in Christ. 
that this is what he's come to do. And that is the answer. We're going to see more about it in just a second. But in, I just want to talk about this man of lawlessness just, just real quick. And in James chapter 3, we see just characteristics of the man of lawlessness that I wanted to look at. And, and, God, and, and James is talking about wisdom from above, and, and he has just been talking about not taming, trying to tame your tongue, and that you can't have blessing and cursing come from the same place, that, you know, bitterness, bitterness and sweetness can't come from the same place, that it's, it comes from different places. And he says, wisdom, wisdom uh, comes from above is good. Wisdom that comes from the earth, bad. <laughs> who, who among you is wise and understanding? Verse 13, let him show by his good behavior and his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have a bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. So he's saying, this is where it comes from. This is the origination of jealousy and selfish ambition. And jealousy, and it's not the same word with jealous God, but it has the idea of envy. For where, and, and this is the kicker for me, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder, which means confusion. The other, the other word is political unrest. To describe this word, there is disorder in every evil thing. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable and gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. <laughs> and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, by the peacemakers. So what do we see? We see that there is, there is this characteristic of worldly wisdom that, that only leads to disorder and chaos and confusion. And it originates, it originates from the flesh. It originates from the demonic. If you think about jealousy, what is, what is jealousy? I, I looked it up in Miriam's dictionary. A feeling of unhappiness caused by wanting what someone else has. So you're not right unless you have what somebody else has, and you're upset about it, and you're going to do whatever you can to get it. That's jealousy. It's, it's akin to envy. And then pair with that selfish ambition, the word is self-seeking, is that, that I want what I want, that I want what I need, and that you pair jealousy, that I want that and I need to have it because I'm the most important. You pair those two things together, and I see, and you have, you have the recipe for the man of lawlessness. Why do you say that, Jim? Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. I know I love to talk about Jesus, and Jesus is the answer, but I think that sometimes we need to know who our enemy is. And Scripture does talk about him. And in Isaiah, Isaiah 14, and then there's another passage in, in Ezekiel 28, and you can get a, a, a good feel for, for who he was created as and what happened to him. And in Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah 14, we get the description of the great morning star, or the bright morning star. And it's speaking of the king of Babylon. And clearly, he's not just talking about the physical king. Because if you go through this whole chapter, you understand, oh, this, this cannot just all apply to a physical king. But as Daniel was praying and was asking for answers from heaven, and that, that Michael was sent to deal with the prince of Persia, 
The prince of Persia was not a human man on the earth. The prince of Persia was the spirit controlling the air of Persia, controlling the spiritual atmosphere. And that Daniel had prayed, and Gabriel said, I was sent the first day that you, that you started to pray, but I had to have Michael come and war with me to remove the prince of Persia. He's talking about a spiritual reality. Well, right here, we're getting the king of Babylon. And if you look in Revelation, you can see Babylon the great will fall. And it's talking about this this spiritual kingdom that God is overthrowing the kingdom of darkness. That Satan is rule over. So we see, it says in verse 12, and we, we see that it's the five I wills. The five I wills of the man of lawlessness. The five I wills of Satan. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning? I guess I started in 12. Son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nation. In the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. This is Satan. This is Lucifer created glorious and perfect and beautiful, as we see in Ezekiel 28. Just a a guardian cherub in in charge of, of worship in the heavens. But it says that that, he, that unrighteousness entered into him. Jesus talks about Satan. He says, righteousness, unrighteousness entered into him. And he began to say these things. And we can see in this, what can you see? I can see jealousy, and you can see self-seeking. No wonder where jealousy and self-seeking are, that's every evil thing exists in that place. Because that's... That's Satan right there. That's where evil has its origination from. I will ascend to heaven. That not only I will ascend to heaven, that it wasn't just being up in the sky, but, but I will ascend to the throne. It, just, it says this, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. That I will, and the stars of God oftentimes are talking about the host of heaven. I will raise myself above all the host of heaven, that I will be the one that will be worshipped. That I will exalt my throne. He says, and I will sit on the amount of the assembly or the congregation in the recesses of the north. I will sit and I will judge all things. That I will judge the host of heaven, I will judge the earth. He says, and I will ascend above the heights of clouds. Now, he's not just talking about a fluffy little white cloud in the sky here. You know, so often we talk about the glory cloud of God coming down on the mountaintop. And we see that people saw this glory cloud. He says, I will be above the presence of God. I will ascend above those mere clouds. I will make myself like the most high God, that I will be rule of all things. This is what Satan is saying. This is what Satan, Satan, this is what Satan was cast out of heaven for. And that Jesus, Jesus tells us then that when this happened, that violence filled his heart. That Jesus, in, in John 8, 43, it says, he's talking, to, he's talking to the disciples, but he's talking a lot to the Pharisees. He says, why don't you understand what I'm saying? It is because you are unable to accept my message. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refer, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar, and he's the father of lies. Wow, Jesus is giving me a pretty good picture. But his, that murder and lies were consuming him, and that he was, going, he, he was going to rule all things, and the only way that that could happen was for him to remove God. What was in his heart? To kill God. 
that God would be dead, then I will rule all things. Satan's answer for what he wanted was death and destruction. <laughs> that was his answer. But thanks be to God, we have a better answer. In Jesus Christ, that his answer was life and his own blood. <laughs> that that's what Jesus came to give as the answer to this, to this this wickedness in the heavens. That Jesus would come into that place of that wickedness and that evil. And he would get in your face. And, and this is the best in your face of Satan, I think, passage. Uh, I love this passage. Philippians chapter 2. The in your face Satan passage. <laughs> I'm glad you guys appreciate my humor. I don't know if I'm all that funny sometimes, but there are things that just tickle me. Um, so in verse 3, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfishness, self-centeredness. Okay, well, let's set it right out. Let's do nothing from this self-seeking or empty conceit, arrogance. This, this setting myself up, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Why should we do this? Do not merely look on your own personal interests, but the interests of others. Why? That we would have the attitude that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be a thing to be held onto at all costs, that I'm not going to set aside my deity. I'm not going to set, set aside my godness for anything because I, got, I, I have a right to be in this position. That Jesus has this attitude and he sets these things aside. He says, but he empties himself. He humbles himself. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The exact opposite of what Satan had done in the heavens, of what Lucifer was doing. Jesus comes and he says, your will, done. Your will be done, Father. Lord, I'm going to set... I want to set all of these things aside, and I'm going to humble myself before you. Because I want to honor you that way. God. It's no wonder that, the, that Isaiah says that with his sacrifice, God was satisfied. With the anguish of his soul, he was satisfied. That Jesus was willing to put himself in agony so that we would all be right with the Father, that the Father would have right communion with all of his kids. So therefore, <laughs> for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and he alone is Lord. That this is the in-your-face moment for Satan. That the way to exaltation was not self-seeking, self-centered promotion, but it was humbling yourself in the sight of God, being obedient, obedient to lay your life out, to give yourself as an offering. He is the same God today that delights in that sacrifice. The answer to the man of lawlessness is the Son of God. The answer to the spirit of lawlessness is the revealing of the sons of God. That we have been manifested we have been revealed on the earth as a manifestation of the Son. 
1 John 3 tells us that we are the sons of God. Now we are sons and daughters of God. Now we are the display of God on the earth, that we have this same attitude that was in Christ Jesus, that we come in an opposite spirit to all these things that the enemy would love to us to bite on. I want you to bite on hate. I want you to bite on revenge. I want you to bite on anger. I want you to bite on division. I want you to bite on prejudice. I want you to grab hold of all these things. Satan's just, yes, grab hold of these things. Go, go for it. And Jesus is like, that's not my way. That's not what I do. That's not me. You can do that, but that's not me. That's the enemy. That's that's the spirit of lawlessness. That I want the spirit of peace. The spirit of truth. Let the spirit of truth reign in me. Let it be seen through me that God's kingdom would be glorified. That Jesus Christ came with loving kindness and selflessness. Loving kindness, that the, the word is hesed. It means covenant acts of love. Continual covenant acts of love. That's a, the, the Hebrew word understanding of chesed or, or just this loving kindness. This loving kindness of the Lord is everlasting. That Jesus came in that kind of love. That he displayed the love of God. He didn't display it just only on the cross, although he certainly did it on the cross. He, did, he finished the work on the cross, but he was doing it all through his life. A life of selflessness. A life of loving kindness. Acts of love through through salvation, through good news being proclaimed. That that you have heard it said, but I say to you, God loves you. But I say to you, God is for you. But I say to you that there is hope, that he gives you life, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life, and that life in abundance, and that life full to overflowing, that that is why I come. And that he would stay in town after town, and he would heal all their sick. They would, they would hear that Jesus was there, and he would be there, and he would love on them, and love on them, and love on them. And even after Jesus was risen from the dead, it says he comes back, and he meets with his disciples, and he fixes them breakfast. A God of the universe that has all things under his feet, that upholds all things by the word of his power, and he's making them breakfast. That's my God. That is, that is why Jesus is so in your face, devil. Maybe that should be the title of the message, in your face, devil. You can probably just do that one. But God has called us into this same place, is what I'm trying to get to. And I can't get into 1 John 3. God has called us into the same spirit, the same way of operating in today. That the world would love us to get to bite on just all these things that have happened in this last week. Just be angry and hateful, just bitter and angry. That's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is forgiving, merciful, gracious loving, kind, gentle. You looked at that wisdom from above. It was gentle. It was peaceable. It makes peace. Peace comes from from those that have received this peace. A video of coming in the opposite spirit. Just a great testimony. You guys can go ahead and play it. I just want to kind of wrap the things up with this testimony. It's a church in Chico, California. And they had a lot of good testimonies of coming in the opposite spirit. And this was, uh, this was another one that they had. I just wanted to share it with you guys.
Chico, California is a diverse community. It has the spectrum of conservative and liberal. The conservative because it's such an agricultural area and, um, and the university helps bring in more liberal side. And that is played out in many arenas, not just in politics, but even in our newspapers. We have, we have two newspapers here in Chico. One is the Enterprise Record. It tends to be a little more conservative. And then there's the Chico News and Review. For years, it wasn't just liberal. It was very far left in its views and opinions. It was a weekly magazine, a free uh, magazine that was uh, distributed widely throughout the city. One day, and I don't know why, they, they chose to do an article of the church I was the senior pastor of. They sent a person into the sanctuary, unknowns to us, on a Sunday morning. And then they did an article that showed up in the a magazine that week. Not the most flattering, to say the least. It was, yeah, it, it was painful. And many of our people in the congregation were rightfully upset that such a piece would be done. Some even said it was like a hit piece against the church. And, but as I was thinking and praying about this, I was reminded from the scriptures how Jesus taught us to come in the opposite spirit, to bless those that persecuted, to love our enemies. And so I remember telling our congregation on the Sunday morning after the article came out that we're not going to speak negative, we're not going to write letters to the editor complaining or any of that sort of thing. In fact, I shared with the congregation that I had written a letter to the person who wrote the article. And in that letter I said to them, I know what it's like as a leader to be criticized and for people to disagree with you. And although I don't agree with your characterization uh, of, the, uh, of our church, I'm not going to criticize. In fact, I want to give you a gift certificate for dinner for two for you and your wife. And I put it in the envelope and just kind of shared a few more thoughts and sent it off to them. And I didn't hear anything more until about two weeks after that. I got a call from the owner of the News and Review who lived in Sacramento asking to take me out to lunch. I might have had too that just prior to that invitation, that editor of the News Review here in Chico had been fired. I didn't know if there was any connection at all, and I didn't, I didn't take any, I didn't revel in the fact that he was fired. I just didn't know what had happened. When this man took me to lunch, the owner of the News Review, he profusely apologized to me for the article that was written. And frankly, he said it was sort of a last straw that the sort of irresponsible journalism he felt was coming out of the, the newspaper, that he wanted to put an end to that, and told me that not only had this person be released, they were sort of cleaning house and, and they were putting new editorial staff in place. The amazing thing took place that I never thought would happen is that, that it, the newspaper shifted away from a very, very left-wing liberal to a much more moderate. In fact, some of the people on the left said they sold out. But they became very responsible uh, uh, newspaper and did good journalism. In fact, I, I applaud some of the work that they do in the community. And the, the point is this, though. If someone had said to me, let's make it our goal to, 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 re to move this magazine to a more responsible place and maybe what I would consider less damaging to the community and it's editorializing, I would probably not know how to do that and never even think it would be possible. And yet, when we came in the opposite spirit, when we chose to do what Jesus said and applied those kingdom principles, it's amazing what took place and the shift that took place that I never thought would ever happen. We have powerful weapons the Lord has given to us, mighty to tear down strongholds. God never told us as the Christian people to make our efforts in warfare of, of petitioning and protesting, rather coming in this opposite spirit, coming in the opposite spirit of whatever's coming against us and watch how he works. I've seen it work. I've seen a newspaper change its philosophy and its direction when we apply what God tells us to do and obey him and love our enemies. I just think that's such a great testimony, isn't it? I mean, just change, you, you think, oh, what could I do to change the, the views of a paper? And, and just coming in that opposite spirit, he just, he just saw that whole thing change. I love there's another testimony of this same city and the same pastor and their church, and there was this huge Halloween festival that was going on, and it was just, it was beyond just a Halloween festival. It was 
it was just getting awful. Just debauchery and wickedness was going to all new levels. And just thousands and thousands were coming in and just really destroying the downtown center. So they came in the opposite spirit, and they put, there was a little gazebo in the middle of that, in the middle of that downtown square, and they put their worship team down in the middle of that one, one Halloween. And he said that the police were begging them to leave. <laughs> Would you please leave? We don't want you in here. And so they just kept a, they kept a, like a, a line for them to run when they needed to run. And, and anyway, it, it didn't happen that year. But three years later, there was a dramatic shift, and something happened, and they gathered the churches, and they were praying. And in fact, they were praying that night while this revelry was going on. And, it, and it's, he said that the police came, and they busted in their doors and said, we don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Because everything was just shutting down, and, and people were just leaving, and it was just like nothing. And they haven't had that festival ever since that night. And that they took back the center of town, and that you could see part of that town, but it, the, the, the center of town was just now filled with all these fountains, and it's just beautiful. And it's just so great to think of what happens if we would just push back, but put, not push back the way that the world pushes. I hear all kinds of people saying, well, you, you gotta, we all got to get our guns and we got to get ours. You know, that's not the way of Christ. Not this, I'm, I'm not even going down the gun issue, okay? Um, I don't put me in a box or anything, please. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's the way of Satan is violence. Okay, now I got to say it. Okay, but I, I do believe in protecting yourself. I understand all these things. You understand me and my heart. Let's be like Jesus. Jesus wasn't getting his 45 to go out and blow someone down that was rubbing in the wrong way. It wasn't the way that Jesus. David, speaking of which, so let me just leave you with this. So David, remember David came to King Saul when Saul was troubled, when he had demons oppressing him. So David would come and he would play. And he would play, and the spirits couldn't handle David's worship, so they had to leave. So we find out that one time this is happening, and Paul and, and Saul grabs up his spear and throws it at David to kill him. It says that David wasn't killed, thankfully, but David didn't pick up the spear and throw it back. What is amazing to me is then the very next chapter, what do we see David doing again? He's before Saul, and he's leading worship. He's praising, he's praying, and he's singing, playing on the harp before this, God, this king who desires to kill him. This is how David met with that. This is why David became king, I believe. Because of this kind of heart. This is the kind of heart that God says, He is a man after my heart. Because of this right here. Because of the way He responds like this. That God is looking for us to be people that respond in an opposite spirit. The way that we would, we would just like Jesus, get in your face, devil. I'm going to get in your face with love. I'm going to get in your face with, with forgiveness and mercy. Jesus, with the woman caught in adultery, same thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this on its head. That's the way of Jesus. God was giving me a picture about the God of peace will soon crush Satan. You, I don't know if you saw some of these um, videos uh, about police officers getting hugs in Dallas. But there's, they had a, a bunch of police officers downtown Dallas, and that there was all kinds of people coming and just giving hugs. And I heard as I was seeing that being played out, I was hearing, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan. Underneath the feet that are going to love. Underneath the feet that are going to restore. They're going to, to bring blessing. That this is, this is what the earth needs. This is what the world needs. 
is a, a demonstration, a manifestation of that opposite spirit. So this morning, I just want to do this activation. Um, I read this week, there's at least 20, and I read it earlier in the week. I read that there was at least 20 veterans that commit suicide every day. Man, that's a painful statistic. Every day. And I think, as soon as I read that, I was like, I know a lot of veterans. I know a lot of them have gone through a lot of stuff. I know the pain that they've been through. I know a lot of the things that they've shared with me. And I don't know everything, for certainly. And then, and, then when I, and then when I saw that this shooter in Dallas was a veteran, I said, Lord, how do we break this cycle? And then I got that picture. A God of peace crushing Satan as his people are coming with love, coming with restoration coming with grace and mercy, coming with his truth. That I just see, I see Satan just trying to get people worked up, and they're just bent on going and loving. And I just see Satan like, ah, you know, and I just see, I got a vivid imagination, okay? So, so I see just Satan like, ah, you know, and, and just a crowd of people just walking with the purpose of love and restoration. Just like Jesus. And so as there was just so many things um, that we could do, uh, this is one thing I, I felt like I wanted to do today. And I hope this it wouldn't just be like a one-time thing. I think that's great. Go ahead, hug a police officer. If you ever see a police officer, say thank you and hug them. And tell them, you can blame it on your pastor. Say, my pastor said that I need to come and hug you and bless you. If you want to, pray for them. That would be great. They would love that. But this morning, I wanted to do that. I want, I want to ask our veterans to come up. And I want to do an activation today in this place. I, 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 now, I don't think that you guys are going to commit suicide, any of you. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying let's break the spirit of lawlessness. Let's break the spirit of pain. Let's break the spirit uh, of, of, of all of this division just by acts of love. Jim, that's so simplistic. Yeah, maybe it is. I think it's the way of Christ. So I'm not trying to put you guys on display, but I am. So I'm going to ask the veterans, uh, any veterans, I want you to come up. And we want to love on you. And, and what I'm going to do is, uh, Frankie's just going to play. I'm gonna, and you just can come right up here. I mean, maybe, maybe give yourself some space because there, there's going to be a lot of people loving on you. But let's, let's do this. Let's do this in your faith, Satan, where you wanted to cause destruction, where you wanted to cause division, where you want to cause pain. Lord, I thank you that you bring healing. You bring love. You bring your truth. And so I'm just going to ask you all to come up. Just come on up. And I just want you to, if you don't want to hug, you don't have to, but hug, say bless you, thank you, we love you. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for what you do. We thank you that you embraced us with your love. That even while we were going our own way, Lord Jesus, that you broke through. That mercy triumphs over judgment. So Lord Jesus, I thank you for your mercy that you showered upon us. And Father, we pray that we would be instruments of your mercy on the earth. That we would shower your love to those who are broken and are hurting and are divided. Father, we just thank you and we just pray that those people that that maybe even veterans that are just, that maybe this was, they were thinking this is their last day. Lord, I pray that you would put the church.